soul. In Hebrew, nefesh. In Greek, sukre. The soul is the place of our unique personhood. Unlike common understandings, the biblical understanding of soul encompasses both our physical and spiritual being. It is the way we belong with others in the body of Christ, the Church, and the place from which our unique giftings and talents are lived out. Just want to do a little shout out to Natasha, who's in the sound booth. Nope, don't duck down. Everybody turn around. Say hi to Natasha. Natasha made our bumper video. She did the animations for that. Uh, so thanks so much, Natasha. You can give her a little hand if you want. Thank you. It's awesome. Uh, we appreciate her and the, and the visual work that she does for us. Often lots of our sermon bumpers and series stuff, Natasha has a hand in. So thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, we are in week three of our series on soul this morning, and it's a series where we are focused on unpacking who we are, our personhood, our identity, our, our nature, the things that make you, you. And as we've unpacked over the last couple of weeks, and as we hear in the bumper video each week, the soul is not just the spiritual side of us, which goes to be with Jesus when we die. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. It's your body and your spirit together, your entire personhood. That's your soul. Uh, and up until this point in the series, I don't think anybody's actually unpacked our, our logo. So we have uh, these two circles over here. But this, this is where the, the two circles come into play, this idea of spiritual and body existent. It's that idea of personhood. Who we are exists as an embodied soul, a spiritual existence and a physical existence together as one soul. So you're a soul, I'm a soul, we are all gathered here together as souls together. Now last week we unpacked a little bit about what happens to our bodies when we die and the hope of the resurrection, the resurrected body when Jesus returns. If you missed it, I'm not going to unpack all that again, because uh, we really got into it. And if you haven't had a chance to see that sermon, make sure you go back and watch it. But I want to start by sharing an image that we ended with last week. This is where we ended. As followers of Jesus, we live in these two realities. The reality of human history. Human history which has a beginning and an end. Jesus will come, will return again to bring history to its conclusion. And we also live into this other reality, the reality of the life of the kingdom of God, which began, it was inaugurated with Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and will continue on eternally. And these are not separate or separated realities. You see, because of Jesus, they exist together. It's an overlap. It's why we can experience the power of life in the kingdom, what it means to be a child of God, and, and the realities of life in the kingdom in our lives today, here and now in human history. And so right now, we live here. Yeah, nice job, Georgia. Uh, it, so it's, it kind of gives us a visual of like a map, like this you are here moment. We live in the overlap. We live in the overlap between the now and the not yet. In the reality of the present age of human history with access to the kingdom of God through the Holy Spirit living inside of us. We know that Jesus will return one day to judge the living and the dead. And that scripture says the dead in Christ will rise and our bodies will be transformed into his glorious body to live together with Jesus and all other Christ followers for eternity. And if that's confusing to you, again, go back and watch last week's sermon where we unpack that. But that, we talked about all the future, the resurrection. What do we do now? What are we to be about as Jesus followers now? That's what we're talking about this morning. The definition of discipleship that we work with here at Eastview is this. Discipleship is a journey of following Jesus as Lord, becoming like Jesus and reconciling our neighbors to Jesus. And so today we're looking at this middle part of our definition. What does it look like to become like Jesus? As we live as Christ followers into this now and not yet space, 
the now of the kingdom of heaven coming, the now of the Holy Spirit, and the not yet that Jesus still needs to return to make all things new, what are we to be about as his people? How do we love the Lord our God with our whole soul, with every part of our being? What is Jesus wanting to do in us and through us as individual souls and as a collective of souls together? When I was a kid, if I wanted to do something, some activity or something, my parents would always make sure that I had a proper instructor for it. If it was piano, I had a piano teacher. When I started playing goal in hockey, I had a goalie coach. And when I quit piano because I wanted to play the drums, which were way more fun, guess what? My parents made sure that I had to take lessons for that too. See, my parents knew something that I didn't know at that age. If I was going to grow in a skill, and if I was going to really enjoy it, I would need some coaching, some instruction that would help me understand how it all worked. And I can remember the first couple drum lessons that I went to and some key things that I learned that stuck with me right to today. Rudiments were a big one. This is theory for drummers. The 26 standard drum rudiments were standardized rhythmic stick movements that were taught to drummers. It's something we all had to practice. It's something we all had to memorize. Uh, and one of my favorite ones, you're going to love this, the, my favorite uh, rudiment is called a paradiddle. And yes, it's my favorite just because it's called that. Can you say it with me? Paradiddle. Paradiddle. Very good. Uh, and it goes like this. It goes uh, with your right hand and left hand. Those are your drumsticks. Right, left, right, right. And then left, right, left, left. Right, left, right, right. Left, right, left, left. And so guess what? We're going to do it. Uh, so pull out your drumsticks. Go like this. And we're going to do this together really slowly, okay? So right, left, right, right. Left, right, left, left. Right, left, right, right. Left, right, left, left. So you now all know how to drum. Way to go. Give yourselves a hand. That was great. The other thing I remember from uh, my first lesson was a trick for doing a faster drum roll. So again, everybody just, in your own way, do a drum roll right now. Okay, that's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's pretty slow. Uh, we, can, we can get faster. So I want to teach you this little trick. Uh, if you do a drum roll, rather than just going one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, over and over and over, it's actually slower. You'll go faster if you do it in triplets. So right, left, right, left, right, left. Right, left, right, left, right, left. And so we're going to do that. You can follow with me. We're going to start slow, and then we're going to speed up, and we're going to see how we do. Okay, so right, left, right, left, right, left. Right, left, right. Jason, come on. Get in here, man. Right, right, left, right. Okay, a little faster. Okay, faster. All right. Good job, give yourselves a hand. Way to go. What is with it? Nobody knows how to clap after doing that. It's like your brain is rewired and this just doesn't work anymore. Good job. Those are some of the things that shaped my drumming. And so as much as I fought it, I am thankful to my mom and dad for making me do lessons and for an instructor to, that, to help me replace some of the bad habits, replace some of the things that slowed me down with things that would make me better. Now, what made a coach or an instructor go from good to great in piano or in drumming or when I played hockey was not just that they would point out all the bad habits. My wrong finger placement in piano, my lazy backbeat on the drums, or my cheating off the post in goal. They would get into the game with me. They would show me on the piano. They would show me on the drums. They would show me in the net the things that I needed to do to become better at the craft. They would identify the things that were detrimental to my growth and my success and replace those things with better tendencies and better techniques. Now, if you remember this summer, we went through a series called My Favorite Jesus Story. And on one of the Sundays, uh, Kay Wagner, who's part of our prayer ministry here at Eastview, she talked about the Holy Spirit being like our personal trainer for following Jesus. And I'm so thankful for this analogy and for Kay's words that morning. Because when it comes to being a disciple, it doesn't all come together for us all at once. 
It's not we, like we believe in Jesus and all of a sudden everything has fallen into place and we know how to follow him perfectly. No, if you have given your life to Jesus, you know that there's parts of your life that don't look like Christ yet. It's a journey. It's this idea of growing, of identifying areas of our lives that are preventing us from loving fully. It's something that the Holy Spirit will do for us, in us and through us, for the rest of our lives if we yield to his presence and his leading in our lives. And this process will actually lead to us becoming more like Jesus than we were before. If you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3 this morning. You can pull them out right now. We're going to be looking at Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Colossians is near the end of the Bible. Uh, you're going to find that between Philippians and 1 Thessalonians. Colossians 3, 1 to 17. And in Colossians, the Apostle Paul, he's writing to an early church community in the Roman city of Colossae. And I love, I love the way he starts this chapter. It picks up nicely for what we're talking about today. So let's take a look, Colossians 3, uh, verses 1 to 17. Paul says, so if you have been raised with Christ, that means if you are a believer, if you are a Jesus follower, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is, <coughs> seated at the right hand of God. <clears throat> Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So here's the, here's the call back to last week. If you've been born again, right? Remember talking about the story with Jesus and Nicodemus, saying you must be born again to see the kingdom of God. If you've been born again, if you believe in Jesus, or the another way that, that we understood it is being born from above, having, having your birthright in heaven, if you have God's spirit in you, then seek the things of God. Your old nature and way of being has died, and you have a new life living in you. And when Christ returns, you will live with him in glory for eternity. Paul goes on and says, Therefore, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them, but now put away all of the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old self and its practices and have put on the new self, you are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. In Christ, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and in all. I love the way Paul writes this. And because he writes in such a way that we will find ourselves in this scripture we find ourselves in one of these descriptions or maybe relate to one of these sins that are being named here. You see, because we all have sin. We all have brokenness and stuff that we come to Jesus with, needing to be healed from. But Paul speaks a word of hope and tells us we are not meant to stay in the state that we come to Jesus in. We are not meant to stay that way. And this is the heart of the gospel this is why Jesus came for us, to restore us back to the vision he had for us in the first place, to live into our existence as embodied souls in ways that image the goodness of who God is. And this is so, so good for us. God loves you. God loves you so much that he will not leave you in the place that you're at. God loves you so much that he will not leave you in the place that you're at. He will continue to work to restore your soul, your whole personhood, everything about you, into the likeness of his son Jesus for your own good and for the good of others. 
I love what we heard in the testimonies of camp, the testimonies of transformation. <clears throat> and particularly in Rebecca's story, when she talks about this, this girl who she saw at camp last year, who gave her life to Jesus, who came back this year, and she sees the change that's going on in her. She says, I can see it in her eyes, the light that she has in Jesus. This is powerful. It's noticeable. It's something that Jesus wants to do in us, bring life change. And we're actually invited to participate in that process. Do you know that God will not force transformation into his son onto you? You need to actually want it and be a part of it. We are called to take off the old and put on the new. That means that we take off sin. We turn from sin. We flee from sin. And we put on the way of Christ. And this does not happen all at once. It's a daily choice. It's a process. It's a journey. And we hear that in verse 10. Look at verse 10. It says, you are being renewed in the knowledge according to the image of your creator. You are being renewed. It's a process. When we take off the old and put on the new, we make a legitimate, intentional, daily choice to say, Jesus, I do not want to be enslaved to this anymore. I do not want to have this lust or this gossip or this rage or these evil thoughts against another person. I don't want the power of sin to rule over me. I want your power, the power of your Holy Spirit, to rule in me and change my life. When we do that, when we actually want that, then the Holy Spirit will day by day transform us into the likeness of Jesus. The more we take off the old and put on the new. So what are we called to put on? What are we called to put on? What does it look like to become like Jesus? Let's take a look at verse 12, because Paul describes it in this way. Paul says, Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion or uh, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also are to forgive. Above all, put on love which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ, to which you were called in one body, rule in your hearts. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In another letter Paul writes to the church in Galatia, he says something similar, but he describes it as the fruit of the Spirit. We put on, and the Spirit produces in us. We are partnered with the Holy Spirit in our transformation into Christ's likeness into souls that increasingly show God to the world around us. And you can hear what's all about. You, you can hear what's central, can't you? Love. Love is central. Loving God and loving others. Paul calls us, he says, above all else, above all else, put on love. The more we grow and transform and become like Jesus, the better we will love. The better we will love. Love is the outcome. That's what God is going for in us. Love is the outcome. Now, when I quit piano, I quit because I didn't want to put the work in. I gave up, and I regret it. I wished I would have stuck with it. Yes, don't tell my parents. At drums, I worked pretty hard. At hockey, I worked even harder, and I got to play at a pretty competitive level. But what I learned along the way is that at any moment, if I stopped practicing, 
If I stop being intentional with my growth, I would start to backslide. The bad habits would come. The good things that I learned would drift away. And I would actually begin to deform. But in all of these things, the piano and the hockey and the drums, the outcome was performance, that I'd be good at what I was doing. And so here's where the analogy breaks down. Because the difference between honing a skill and becoming like Jesus is not about how good you are at it. It's about love. And we see it so clearly in this passage. And the more attentive we are to growth as followers of Jesus into the likeness of Christ, the more freely we can love God and love others. And in doing so, we participate in God's mission to share the love of God with the world around us. But when we don't, when we don't have intention to grow, when we don't set our minds to following Jesus, when we're not intentional about our growth or we neglect our relationship with Jesus, we will backslide and our souls will actually deform away from the likeness of Christ. And the cost will be love. The cost will be our ability to love. A wise friend once told me that transformation means I look like Jesus more tomorrow than I did yesterday. And tomorrow can mean a day from now, a week from now, a month from now, or a year from now. And yesterday can be a day ago, a week ago, a month ago, or a year ago. What matters is that we are taking steps. We are following and yielding to the Spirit and the work that he wants to do in our soul, in our whole self, to the work Jesus wants to do in you and through you. Our mission here at Eastview is leading people to Christ and onto maturity in him. This is the maturity part, that we grow to look more like Jesus tomorrow than we did yesterday. Whatever that timeline looks like, that timeline is not up to us. It's up to the Lord. So practically, practically, how do we do this? I want to share three things about our attitudes that can help us to practically live into this life change that Jesus wants to bring for us. First is intention. We actually have to want to grow. We actually need to acknowledge that and agree that we have things in our lives. We have parts of the old self that are getting in the way of our ability to love. And we need to want to take them off and put on the new life in Christ. You need to start by asking yourself the hard question, do I want to grow? Do you want to be rid of the sin that you have in your life? Do you want to be free from the stuff that is weighing you down? The stuff that's actually corrupting who you are? The stuff that's deforming your soul? Do you want to have your soul shaped and molded to be full of the love of the Father. So you can love God, so you can love yourself, so you can love others in the way of Jesus with greater abundance each day. It comes down to this question, do you want to journey with Jesus and become like him? The second thing we need to think about is partnership. We all need help. We need to see our transformation Formation into Christ's likeness as something we cannot do on our own. Rather, we are partnered with the Holy Spirit in our transformation. He is the one transforming. We are the ones submitting. You need to actually ask for the Holy Spirit's help in this. I think a huge part of taking off the old is daily coming to the Father and saying, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. I need the work of your spirit to bring healing to my life, to speak to me about what I need to focus my attention on, to lead me in your ways. It's not a coincidence that Jesus regularly spent time with his father in solitude. Jesus always saw himself as partnered with the father. And Jesus gave us his Holy Spirit as our counselor and as our guide. So the question that we need to ask ourselves is this. Do you actively seek the Holy Spirit's guidance and obey with action? 
The last piece is community. We need to be transforming together with other souls on the journey. Mentors and leaders or a community of people who are on the journey together to encourage and spur each other on. This is why we organize our church in such a way that no matter what age you're in, you're grouped together with other people who are journeying together with Jesus. Whether you're a kid, a youth, a young adult, or an adult, we prioritize and make places and spaces for people to be able to come together and be on the journey together. You need to be with other followers of Jesus to hold each other accountable and cheer each other on in the journey of growth. You see, because when you see and hear the stories of another's transformation, whether they've overcome a battle with addiction or maybe they're stepping into a more loving posture towards people, their growth can help inspire and bring hope to your own journey. And your own journey and growth can help encourage and inspire others. Likewise, the forgiveness we receive when we fail and fall short, because we will fail and we will fall short at times, it reminds us that we are human and that we're not alone in our failure and that God's grace is always greater than the failure we've experienced. Always. This kind of community happens in places like life groups, triads, working through the discipleship pathway, whatever it is, intentional community coming together to pursue Jesus. This is essential to becoming like him. So the question you need to ask yourself is, are you in a community of people who you can be honest with, where you can grow together and encourage one another and hold each other accountable to following Jesus? Do you have that kind of community in your life? In a few moments, my friend Arisnel is going to come up and lead us in a time of communion. And we're going to worship God through a few songs. And after the service is over, we're going to have the prayer team uh, up here at the front available to pray for you. If you have something that you need prayer for or someone that you want to bring forward in prayer, I invite you to come be prayed for by our prayer team this morning. My invitation to you today is this. Will you trust God with your whole self, with your soul? Will you trust God with your whole self? When we do this, when we trust and move with intention, when we partner with the Spirit and when we walk it out in community, then we, our souls, will transform more and more into the likeness of Jesus. And we will Because of that, we will increasingly be able to show the love of God to a watching world just by the ways we exist. You see, and I want you to hear this. It's not about us doing more or doing another thing. It's not about that at all. It's about turning to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I need you. Would you lead my life? And seeking day by day to follow him. In a few weeks, we're going to be starting uh, a series called Partnering with the Spirit Inside of You. And we're going to be looking at this exact thing. What does it mean for us to grow in our attentiveness to Jesus' presence with us and be obedient to the Spirit's leading in our lives? And next week, Pastor John will lead us through our last sermon in this soul series. We're going to be focused on what it means to reconcile our neighbors to Jesus in light of our understanding of soul. What does it mean as souls to be attentive to the souls of others? To reach out in ways where we can share about the hope that we have in Jesus and what he's done for our soul. We're talking about souls on mission. But for now, as we close, I just invite you to pray with me. And let's prepare our hearts together for communion, for this experience of identifying with Jesus, death and resurrection, as souls here together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have created us and you've called us fearfully and wonderfully made. You've given us salvation through your son Jesus and invited us to live by the Spirit, to walk in the ways of love that you modeled for us. Jesus, help us to live with intention, to walk in partnership with your Spirit and to journey with other people along the way. Help us to love more today than we did yesterday. 
so that we can be a blessing to all we encounter and so that some may come to know the love that you have for them. Prepare our hearts to receive communion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, those of you who are here and those of you who have watched online, we want to thank you for joining today's worship service. We look forward to having you again next week. In a minute, we're going to have a blessing before we depart. I would like to remind you just those, if there are any of you who would like to, to pray with somebody for yourself or somebody else, there will be members of the prayer ministry team at the front. So feel free to come in. Somebody will be here, will be here to pray with you. Let us receive a blessing from the book of Numbers. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Have a great week. See you next time.